perspective is more powerful than attitude. Because we all talk about attitude and having a good attitude. You can bung on a good attitude. But unless it comes from a consistent perspective on the inside, that leadership matters and your influence matters, then it's all fake. And you won't get loyalty from your staff. I'll give you a corporate comparison just quickly and then we'll have some questions. But many years ago, I was a trainer in a photography company and we all had a, a group day where all the trainees and the trainers got together for some group training. And at the end of the day, and I was getting right into it because I thought this is good, you know, the, more, the better you train, the more money you make because you do a better job. And my trainee said to me, I was talking to another trainee and her trainer said to her, oh, this is all bull. When, when you get back to your studio, you, you just do the way you want it to do. Now, who's heard that about training? People turn up to something and they go, yeah, 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 and then you just go back and do it your own way. That'll be happening underneath you unless you can get a hold of those people and cast that vision and really connect with people and care about them. And that is the difference that will take you forward. So the keys of leadership are the keys of life and they're personal and they're real. And whether it's, whether it's work or home, it's the same and that consistency is what will sustain you and take you forward. So um, if there's anything that I've covered or haven't covered or, you know, you could talk all day on principles of leadership, but those are the things that sustained me as I went through. Controlling what I thought about, having a sense of purpose, having a sense of destiny, being other centred so that I wouldn't feel sorry for myself, knowing that it was going to turn around. What about in your businesses? Questions? Comments? Stones to be thrown? Uh, yeah. Oh, just a quick question, going back to, you know, the, using the main that talk part of people to mm-hmm. get rid of the pressure. Um, going through the reflection of that after the fact when the realisation was that was the wrong thing. Has that changed you in a way that you would never go down that road of that whole investment process again? Like for us as a business, sometimes you may do something that at the end of it, it breaks and you go, I'm never going to do that again. I want to make sure that the all starts and my, my company ever do that again. But that may be the wrong decision. Just because it failed for me and I did the wrong yeah. thing doesn't mean the next person won't be successful to do it. So you're asking whether I would go back to investing again? Well, the thought process around when you're going through that, not so much when you go back to investment, but the thought process around resolving what I did, what I could have done. Yeah. How did that work for you? Like, sometimes I struggle with it. Like, yeah. I can be the, uh, put my hands up and say, never get to lock it away. Yeah, well, the key is to be courageous and analyse the difference between the baby and the bathwater. Because it wasn't all bad and it wasn't all wrong. I made a wrong decision. Uh, and if you have to have two things. You have to have objective checklists where you have standards that do not change. You know, when I was going through uni, we talked about absolutism and relativism. And is, it, is it really right or is it really wrong? Does it depend on the circumstances? No, no. There is right and there is wrong in business. Lies are wrong. Don't do it. You're better off to say, I don't know, I'll get back to you. Or have some standard phrases that, that I keep, which is, I can't give you an answer right now. Having being able to analyse it, I've been able to prepare. And as you leaders and your training, you have checklists of things that, that will help you prepare for assessing an opportunity. And actually, I just happen to have a book that will <laughs> that has got such checklists and questions you should ask and things that, that um, will help you to do it again, but do it right and do it better. The other side of the coin, which is the flip, the other side of your brain, is controlling your emotions and knowing your triggers, knowing what's vulnerable to you. If if a great pair of bullies turns your head, fellas, and you know that you're vulnerable, you don't go into a room with just that woman. I know it sounds old fashioned and sexist, you have to put boundaries in place so that you are not vulnerable. Ladies, same with you. If there are certain things that are your triggers that make you easily persuaded, and when you're honest with yourself, you'll find out what they are. Me, I know, I'm a rescuer. I want to fix 
things for people. I can fix that for you. Let me do that rather than letting them grow. Knowing your triggers. And the third thing, so you've got your logic, you've got your emotion. The third thing is here. Fellas might call it their gut instinct. Sometimes we call it our spirit. It is not your emotions. Just because it feels right doesn't mean it is. It might feel fantastic. An affair, now let's call it what it is, adultery, might give you a buzz, but when you're quiet, when you're still, you know that ick. Now, I haven't made that particular error in my life, but I have built boundaries. I've been tempted and I've built boundaries in my life so that I don't even play with it. Your spirit will tell you what your head and your emotions will not. So you don't have time to listen in that quiet place and listen to it. But it's actually, it is actually quite scientific. It's behind the eye here. There's a, there's a thing in your body that actually triggers that and we give it a, an esoteric sort of label. Yeah. Interesting, one of the stories that you talked to me about was that there was one, was it the big girl that was looking after you that she complained to the spirit because she was getting mis mixed messages or something? Oh, that was a different, oh no, there, there were lots of, they're, they're, they're all different ladies, but yes. Yes, there were. <laughs> you know, I've never had trouble with fellas. You know, with fellas thinking I was giving them the come on, even when I wanted them to. I just don't have that femme fatale, you know, flavour that, uh, that my girlfriends often did and used to complain about fellas and I'd think, geez, I wish I could get some attention. I'm glad I found my husband because I think he just picked me and went, yep, you got you and I was married. Lucky me, which, you know, that was a good thing. But <laughs> what made it really funny is I was at one thing, I was at Wacol for a while and I went to Helena Jones and, and actually would work at the cemetery here every now and again. But there was one lady there, middle-aged lady, um, proudly lesbian, and uh, open about it, and almost like she just had to, you know, it was like her flag. And uh, she was educated, intelligent, and, and a lot of them are not, because they've had drug backgrounds and, and disadvantage and so on. So it was good to talk to someone about business and life and concepts rather than just gossiping backbiting. So we got along really well. And I grew up with brothers, so I'm a bit of a tomboy, so I, maybe that's why, I, <laughs> anyway. But, um, and I got along with her just like I do with my brothers and their mates. And I was called to the office and they said, look, um, and they're so very politically correct. And you may have noticed I'm not, but, because um, if I get too politically correct and tactful, my point will be lost. So you'll have to forgive me. Look, I am, I've been in jail, I'm rough. I'm gonna be blunt. So they said, you're being too familiar. I said, too familiar. I knew, I said, look, I don't go putting my arm around him or hugging them or, you know, I don't touch any, because you've got to be careful. You don't just go doing, I said, I don't, what, what do you mean? You're being too familiar. I said, well, did you go to the, to the, there's a hallway that you have your rooms and the bathroom there and they said, you stopped in the hallway to chat with someone and you just had your towel on. And I said, yeah, well, yeah, but I said, well, we're all girls here. And so I wouldn't do it if there was a fella around. And I went, oh, oh, oh. Hmm. And then I had to try and hide that revulsion because, you know, you're not supposed to, you know, we're supposed to be all very politically correct, you see. So, oh, well, okay. But it was like, I was terrified. And I ended up apologising for misleading a lesbian who thought I was giving her the come on, mixed messages. And then afterwards I thought, she's so open about that, but she wouldn't accept that, you know, okay, I've accepted that, so I'm straight, and then we just, it was just crazy. So we're in a system where, I, I don't know, and I'm not really quite sure what point you can even get out of that, apart from sometimes, no matter how well-intentioned you are, you're going to be misunderstood. And you're going to have to apologise even when you're not wrong. Sometimes, leaders, it's better to be kind than to be right. You don't always have to be the one in the right, even when you're right. But you can read all those stories in book number two. This one is, um, while I was away, I started writing letters uh, telling my friends and family about my 
experiences because I knew it was so, it, it was just so significant and so different. I didn't, I've got a shocking memory, so I knew that when I got out, I'd forget a lot of the stuff. So I wrote it as I went along. And the stuff that is more controversial, because the officers read all the letters, I kept private journals. And uh, my letters that I wrote to my husband, he would then type out as an email to send to our family and friends so that um, I, it would save me stamps and writing the same stories again. And about a year later, my husband said, it's time for you to collate that, and that's what I've got here. And this is, in real time, basically, uh, letters that I wrote, the dates, and slotting in the journal entries. Now, it's not a business book, but it is a leadership book, because you'll learn lots of lessons from it. And I must warn you, it is very personal, very real, very subjective, my interpretation of what went on, and it is filled with my coping mechanisms, which is primarily my faith. So if that's offensive to you, well, that's just, I'll just, don't read it. But if you can be open-minded and have a look in the window of the culture that I come from and how I use those principles, not just about religion, it's the principles that are from that that help. So that's available as well. Um, yeah, so. Any other questions on Trish? Yeah, Trish, in terms of knowing what you wanted to do or clarifying what you're going to do or be when you came out of jail. Did you have, had you established purpose or intent or desire while you're in jail or did it become more real or obvious to you once you're out? Like, where did you reach a point that says, yeah, I know where I am, now I'm going to go forward? Right. Good question. When did I know I was going to go forward? While I was in jail, it's a bit of a bubble. And you're fairly safe there from the influences of the outside world. And I had ideals of, I knew that this was a big thing and that I would somehow use it to benefit other people in an idealistic way. I, I knew that, I never stopped knowing that from the time that the money was lost, I knew that this was something big in my life, just instinctively and spiritually, of course. But when I came home, the reality of, hold on, <laughs> Being a prisoner among prisoners is one thing. Being a jailbird in the respectable world is something very different. And I was broken because as strong as I was and as well as I coped, the damage still happens. And I was ashamed, I didn't want anyone to find out. And I thought, I've done my bit, I'm just gonna get a job. Will you try getting a job with a criminal record? For fraud! When your background is sales and business, you know, so the people coming out of jail, they should just go and get jobs, not go on the dole. Yeah, who's going to give them one? Are you? Do you have a policy that says do a criminal history check? I hope you do. But that shouldn't stop you from hiring someone because many of those people would not take a pen. They would not take a pen because of, the, of what they've been through. They wouldn't take other people, they're career criminals, you can't trust them. Um, I was broken for a long time and I wrestled with it and it was April 2010. I'd been for a job interview where they didn't ask the question so I didn't have to tell. And he said, we want you but we've got to wait for a spot to open up with selling advertising. And a week after I decided I have got something to offer, this is what I'm meant to do, uh, I'm going to go public with what I've got, what I know, which was um, going to publish the Dangerous Wealth book, which is the first fraud warning signals book, and it's particularly for women, this one. Fellas, don't buy this one. Uh, the other one's available. Um, same information, just one more tailored to women. And when I made that decision, I'm going to do this. A week later, I got the phone call, can you start on Monday? And I had to say, thanks, but I'm going to start my own business. And it was he and his wife had been interviewing us, and the first talk that I gave in my hometown she turns up. I knew she would. She turns up and that's when I give a talk to the business and professional women of the town, BPW, and said, and I went to prison and <laughs> I was just, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. And the funny thing is, it's because I went to prison that people listened to me rather than, it, and, and if I hadn't, all I would have is an opinion on how things should be done. So it's actually given me power to speak into the lives of people in a way that I hope touches them on the inside so it's not just theory. This is real life and there are people's destinies in your hands.
got to do it right and do it well and put margins in place. And I love it now. I've been welcomed. Every now and again, I bump into someone, you know, someone will be there with that look, you know, that, that, that look, you know, like a cat's bum? <laughs> and because I expected 80% of people to be that way, when it's only one, it's okay. I'm no longer as much of a people pleaser, so I don't let that bother me. I think that's their right, they can do that. I can't reach everyone. Good on you, Mum, thank you.